Hello, Internet friends, and welcome to Keep the Game Moving. Uh, so we are here live. Eric Lang, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, my pleasure, sir. Hello, Internet. Same Internet. <laughs> the, oh, is there a different Internet? I don't... Oh, there are many Internets. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. <laughs> so we are here live at BGGCon. So I want to give you a couple of quick apologia at the beginning of this episode. One, there's some background noise because we're at a con, so the the food, the cash and carry is right over there. So if you hear folks ordering a sandwich, that's what that is. And people are playing games, so they'll be cheering. And also, we are, uh, uh, we both have taken off our masks. We're both boosted and fully vaccinated. Uh, and we are 20 feet from the nearest part. Well, actually, Ra Rachel's right over there, about eight feet away. But we are well away from folks. So... Uh, we are taking COVID very seriously, and actually, BGG, I've been really impressed with how seriously they've been taking COVID, and the, yeah, the, the so they, they did as much as, I mean, unfortunately, it's, I mean, there's a little Texas going on, so yeah. they're, they, there's a lot of Texas going on. They, they were as strict as they were allowed to be, and you can't ask anyone. Yeah, yeah, the, uh, I want the mask, the, the mask room to be there always, it's, it's, why not? A great gaming space. Why not? Uh, no contract. No contrast. It's going to be a beautiful thing. Uh, so, uh, Eric, if, for those of you who don't know, Eric is a prodigious designer of the board game, the sort of board games that are almost role playing games. Uh, and so, how did you get your start as a GM? As a ooh, right into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's see. I uh, I'm I'm pretty old school, right? Uh, I've been doing this for 20, 25 years. No, yeah, twenty five years. I think. Um, and I got my start in gaming. So what D and D is what made me a gamer. D and D Second Edition Spelljammer oh, kids. Spelljammer. Spelljammer. You've dropped a Spelljammer reference. Yeah, that's true. That's <laughs> so. It was my first, and I, I actually thought that that's what D and D was. <laughs> and I thought that like like like, for, like Forgotten Realms, was some planet called Orth, right? Like, but, but, so when when I got into like main mainstream D and D. Uh, I came at it from a Spelljammer reference. I'm like, where are the flying whale ships? Like, <laughs> Why are there no beholders? That's right. That's right. We're the miniature giant space hamsters. Uh, so, so D and D made me a, ga uh, a gamer, and uh, because I'm a creative at heart, and I'm, I mean, I'm a game designer by by blood as well as anything else. I want to create stuff. I want to be, I want to be the storyteller. I want to be entertaining. Uh, I want to be entertaining my friends. So, like within. I think within my first two or three sessions of D and D, when I was like 19 years old, I went. I was like, "No, I gotta run my own thing. I gotta do my own thing." Right? <laughs> uh, and I remember very, very specifically because there's. Uh, I, I'm sure all of you. I mean, you're all role players, right? I don't know how many of you remember what I call the D and D moments. This is what I call it. Like that was the that was what, like literally my life changed. I'm trying to figure out if the D and D moment is positive or negative. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, it's possible. Right. So, so what it was for me, well, because what I I actually played like uh, Final Fantasy for Super NES first edition, yeah. Ooh. Um, uh, and, and uh, so I, I dabbled around role play. I, uh, I read through the Fighting Fantasy books by Ugh. Steve Jackson and Livingstone, and it was Steve Jackson's Sorcery, which was the sort of right the the, the, the sequel to that that sort of got me into like that gave me a, a taste of that space, right? Like, ooh, this is kind of open ended. What's going on here? And so when I played, I, I played my first session of D and D, and uh, like we did the thing, right? We're like oh, you're all at a bar, <laughs> right? And and they, they, some people are talking, and, and I don't even honestly don't remember the details except they just said, "What do you want to do?" I'm like, well, "What do you mean? What like? Well, tell me what my choices are. Like, what do I like? Where's the monster? What do I fight?" It's like, no, what do you want to do? Like anything? Like I gotta attack the bartender? Like, all right, you want to attack the bartender? I'm like, whoa, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean anything? <laughs> And so who was GMing that game? Uh, an old friend of mine. Okay, a friend here. Um, yeah, yeah and actually, um, uh, and some of my my best friend is from that gaming circle of uh, twenty five yeah. years. It, it was like I found my tribe, I found my friends, and it, it literally blew my mind. <laughs> and I was like, this I can't believe games can be this. And that, that was like, all right, now like with this wide open possibility space. Um, I'm back before possibility space was even a term, right? Uh, I was like, I, I gotta do this. I need to make. Uh, 25 year old version of me was like, uh, 25 years ago version of me was like, I wanna make content for people to explore possibility space. Except I was more like, I wanna make stuff with mind flares. They're cool. <laughs> 
And and so did you quickly become like the forever GM where you were always telling the stories? I would, um, I, I did play, but I always was happiest when I was GM. Mm, I, yeah, I feel exactly the same way. Uh, so how did you kind of, you mentioned sorcery and that sort of thing. So from D&D, &D, what was the evolution to other systems? Um, so I, I did stick with D&D &D for quite a while, I think about two years or so. I heard there were other games, but I was, I, I was, I was so, uh, I was so in, in sorcelled by D and D that I and there was so like this was second edition so that of course that was the first edition that where they had the, the, the different handbooks for all the classes right. so I I devoured them all of them everyone and I just wanted to be deep in this system this world um, then I remember uh, I vaguely remember I, I might be getting dates wrong somebody played a uh, role playing game called Chill um, oh yeah right uh, Chill was so Chill is like. Some people call it the poor man's call of Cthulhu. I call it the the alternative. It's just a yeah. different. It's a different horror game. I actually like the way Chill does the sanity thing better than Call of Cthulhu. Oh, uh, that's a. I mean, that's a very defensible argument, right? Um, and so, yeah. I got, so I was like, oh, this is different. It's interesting. Like, and I, you know, no saving throws, no fago. Like, what's going on? <laughs> and, uh, so that that sort of flew me in. That I played. Um, but it was it was World of Darkness that that blew the doors open, right? It was the because um, I was into role playing games already when the first edition uh, Vampire came in, and it was like it's a role playing game for gods, right? Yeah. Um, and, and and my my girlfriend at the time was a god. They were like like whoa, what's going on? Like this is this is something that you can get, um, and so and that's where storytelling as a uh, as the primary gestalt of gameplay, that hit me. So I was, I got deep into all white wolf stuff, um, and then, I, then I was a system explorer. I, I mean, I played everything. I played James Bond, the James uh, Bond role playing game. Hero. That was the first game that had like hero points, where like that, you yep. can't die because you're James Bond. That's so, right. You know, Derps, like, hero yeah. system. Um, oh, hero system. Hero system. Oh, champions. Champion. Champ I so where every where every superpower had its own character sheet. Right. It was. Like the math involved in champions was like that was the most math I did in high school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't do it today. I don't yeah. want the attempt spent for it today. But I remember it so. So I'm sorry. I got it. No, no, no. This, 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 this is what this is about. I got to tell you about my character. It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, so I, that was the one where I made a character. I still tell people what today, right? Like I have a character who has whose power using their system was he could destroy the universe. Um, the limitation. I, I bought it off. Yeah. The limitation. It was only usable once. <laughs> That's an, I love it. He was just threatened, man. It was if just you yeah, it's my own power. I can destroy the universe, but only one time use. That's outstanding. I uh, my my champions. Re I always joke like every single person in champions was overconfident. Yep. Like everyone bought the twenty point disadvantage, of overconfident, course. and so there was no one in champions who was like, I don't know, maybe I won't do that. You know? Everyone just sort of had like the jersey with yeah. like like plus twenty five on it, like this. led with their chin every That's single right. one. Um, I got I, I got teleportation out of this. Right? See, you're at least you had original ideas. I somewhere in my closet have a binder of not at all knockoffs of every Marvel superhero made in Champions. Oh, I did that too. Yeah. Oh, of course I did that too. Yeah, um, the, you know, Claw Guy or something, you know. Sure. Not at all Wolverine. Uh, sure, absolutely. Champions for me was interesting because it was a, you know, it was a game, like, I, I you know, I, I joke in board games, there's just not a good sports board game. It's kind of the same, there's not a great superhero role-playing game. And, you know, Champions was the game part of it, mm -hmm. and the role playing kind of always was secondary. Sure. And and then there are now there are a bunch of story games that are kind of the the, the inverse of that. Where gotcha. Like, like you know, Mutants and Masterminds. Mutants and Masterminds. Uh, actually, there's a game called Masks. Um, I heard of it. Yeah, Masks is is it's fantastic, but it's you know it's teen emo superhero right. you know like um, which super cool and but it but it. You know the the superhero part of it is secondary. Like it's right. it's taking the Spider Man. Like you That's know right. your your personal life is more interesting than your putting on the mask life. That's right. Uh, that, there's so much precedence in comics for that. Mm -hmm. Like there's, there, there shouldn't be anything new. Yeah. No. But uh, you know I. But it's funny because superheroes are like my white whale. I want that RPG that is sure. sort of all things to, to all people. Sure. You've described your you've described your RPG industry like like. To a T, yeah, right? Yeah. Like every RPG at, at, at its at its core actually is 
in its, at its uh, ideal core is a bespoke experience for every single person who plays it. Yeah. So eventually, we're all going to have the perfect RPG, custom tailored. It'll be, yeah, it'll be such a narrow focus that no one else will play it. Right. What's the population? <laughs> That's how many RPGs there are. Uh, so actually, I you know. If this were a real show, I'd have done some research. And I, I know all your board games, but have you done any RPG development or designing? Yep, but you're never going to see it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I have, uh, I have uh, so I haven't done any professionally. Right. Um, of course, I've designed like God knows how many RPG systems. Before before Magic came out in 1993, I was always doing was designing RPGs. Uh, I designed several. I did my homebrew. I did homebrew campaigns, including layout in Corel Draw Kids and Corel. Draw, I laid out like books because I was I, even back then I was very product minded. I went to uh, uh, layout fascinated me, and I wanted to make these cool digestible books and look really professional. I designed my own worlds for it. I would I just remember some of them you're not going to know because <laughs> your first things are always terrible. Um, I designed. I actually have uh, when people ask. In many interviews, like what is, what is the game that takes you the shortest to make? What's the game that takes you the longest to make? Well, I have a game that I've been loosely working on for my entire life, and it's never going to be published because the point of the game it's an RPG. The point of the game is essentially to be Eric the Iron Man, it's supposed to be me in a box, right? Wow. It's a living document that will always change, and the point of the game is that it's to change, and you're going to discover the game. Like, I'll play any session with anybody, but the point of it is to discover how it actually works. That is like super meta. It, it's a little, it, it's, I don't mean to be, I'm not trying right. to be clever, just like, this is just what I want. This is, it's an evolution of how I feel about RPGs at any given time. And, it, and well, to your, to your point, that's that bespoke thing that you were talking that's right. about. Yeah. That's right. And, and I'm really interested, so you, you, know, you talk about homebrews and that sort of thing. So, were you always a rules tinkerer as oh, a yeah. GM? You know, yeah, you're yeah, like, yeah. this should be plus three versus that should be... Well, not even numbers, like philosophical tinkerer too. Like, I, I'm, to this day, I'm convinced I've never played World of Darkness properly. <laughs> uh, like, some people tell me about how the first edition worked, I'm like, oh, no, no, dude. Really? <laughs> not um, in my game. Right, right. I, I played it like Ars Magica, right? Where, right. Like, like, you just decide what stats you want to throw together, and like, like, yeah, that feels like the right amount of dots, that's it, right? I, you know... A tenet of every game I play and of this podcast is don't let the rules get in the way of the story you want to tell. Sure. You know, that's that's a super important thing. But that's really interesting that, you know, I, I think everybody tinkers a little bit, but I you know, I bet designers sort of at their heart, like, are you a deconstructionist? For a while I was, um, especially at the beginning, right, when I didn't know rules. So like uh, I, I enjoyed the, 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 I had enjoyed the satisfying the intellectual curiosity and reverse engineering how the game came together. Uh, but I never enjoyed a game as much after I reverse engineered it and seen, seen the matrix under it. Uh, I tried to play, I got over that very quickly and I just started playing more intuitively and untraining my brain and just going like, let's be in the moment, let's play, let's... Um, so when you, had a, when you had a group, uh, was it, did the group, did, did you pick the game to run to tell the story you wanted to tell, or were you like, I want to try this system? Uh, both, both. Uh, earlier days, I want to try. I want to try all the systems, right? I yeah. want to be the one to introduce the group to this, and it was mechanics oriented. Honestly, like I remember, so I got into art style games. Uh, oh wow! Uh, um, of course, right? I was the, uh, and and it was like not just TFOS and Cyberpunk, which were, which were fine. Like I, I enjoyed them, but I was like, I, I brought Dream Park to the group. I don't know if you remember those. Dream, like, that Dream Park, Castle Falkenstein, right? That was, Dream Park is the weirdest use of a license, or it's a use of a weird license. Like it's I use of a weird license, and it was very clearly Mike Pondsmith going like, like he's, he went full hand. Yeah. Like, like, I'm going to create the most meta experience ever, and oh my god, I, we, we played that game for a year. I remember. Yeah. Was, that was was I that. I want to be the one to introduce that to our group and blow everything's mind. Was was Dream Park BRP? Was it like the percentile system, like ring nope, rule? No, nope, no, yeah. no, it was a unique system. Yeah, that's it right. It was a unique system that ran. I, I believe was on skills and table. Oh, oh God! See, look at this. <laughs> I haven't thought about this in years. That was the one that had, where everything was rated in uh, in, in uh, adjectives. Right, like Marvel superheroes, the same like right. amazing, you know, like that's right. Of... And that's how you get like I remember extra deadly damage. <laughs> right. right? Like, and because it was because it was so game show oriented, like you had to ha there had to be some transparency between the GM and their GM and the players. So there was there was a real sense of sportsmanship while playing the game. The players would be like, "Wait, why is that extra deadly? Are you are you messing with us here?" Right? <laughs> uh, yeah, it was awesome. That I haven't thought about Dream Park in 
man, I don't know how long. You're very well. Yeah, that's <laughs> I, yeah, a trip down memory lane. I, you know, that, that meta idea is an interesting one where you're sort of thinking of the GM as the G, you know, the GM right. and the, the player thing. There's a um, weird, I, I mean, like a game I would never have played except I was at a con. Uh, there's a, an RPG that is professional wrestling. Uh, Called my, like worldwide wrestling. My God, if I, if you had told me that like, <laughs> yeah, 20, 25 years, 20 years ago, ago like, <laughs> but, but, I loved wrestling and I knew it should have been an RPG. But the cool thing about this game is the GM is the promoter. Of course he is. He's and, Vince McMahon. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. And so like at the be- at the beginning of each round is like or each each thing is like a, a day of television, and mm-hmm. you're like, okay, um, Jim the Russian, you're gonna fight uh, uh, Killer Piranha, right. and Killer Piranha is gonna win. And right. so then, and you, you know, I'm your. But you're doing storyline too, right? Right. Yeah. Right. And so you're you're Jim the Russian, and I'm Kill, Killer Piranha, and we like have a story we're telling, and we get out in the ring, and I'm, you know, my my character is the grizzled veteran, right. and you're like the new hot shot, you know, and right. I'm like I don't want to lose to this punk, right? And so I can, I think they call it in the game they call it going into business for yourself, but right. I can just be like I'm a better wrestler than you. I win. I ain't jobbing for no. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And and but it's that meta thing still, where like the GM is deciding, and then you're like, well, actually, and then that becomes a repercussion, right? Because you go back, and they're like, what the hell, man? You were supposed to lose. Oh my god, I would have been all over that. (laughs) All over that. I I actually, frankly, I wanted to write that game, Uh, but then I got into. uh, By by the time I was like, by the time I realized that I meant that because I was always a huge wrestling fan, especially like late eighties, early nineties. Because it was, I mean, wrestling is game design. It's yeah. absolutely game design, right? It's, 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 it's storytelling. It's, it's um, what's RPG design, yeah. and there are there are absolutely rules, right? And especially now, now they're just so transparent about it, right? Um, and the uh, I got into MMOs, MMORPGs. I started getting into Ultima Online, EverQuest, and that's so I became in this trance with those, and that's, I want to make it a MMO. Right. Instead. It's funny how even as a young person. You only have so much time, and like you become obsessed with one thing. And right. It's just like this is what I'm doing now. That's right. Know? That's right. And I'm gonna spend 20 hours today drinking a lot of Mountain Dew and playing Ultima Online. Um, so you are you. Uh, it's so your RPG design is of a personal nature. Very um, so. Your your board game design is for a commercial nature. Right. But you have designed a bunch of games that use RPG properties. And yep. licenses, and and frankly, from playing them, bring in I think a lot of RPG concepts. Oh yeah, and, my, my RPG past informs my design in all in all senses, absolutely. And and so, you know, I'm really interested in how in the confluence because I think you know we're seeing with games like uh, Gloomhaven and these uh, Tainted Grail and all these sort of mm-hmm. games that are basically role playing games, right? Uh, that that use the crunchy mechanics of the board game and so that interfaces the line between the two I think is getting grayer and grayer right um, and and like how do you see how can you how do you see somebody be using board games to kind of influence and color their home game sure okay so so coming at it from because I've spent most of my I've spent a lot more time immersed in, in, in board game design I mean Board game, board games, because of their, um, because of their, their siloed nature, right? Like every, every single, uh, every game you play, right, is a is a linear and complete experience, right? I know there's campaigns, right. I know there's, and I know there are meta game games and stuff like that. But generally speaking, when when most people think I'm going to play a board game, your instinct is going to be beginning I'm going to play an art from beginning middle to end. It's going to be a session that. Um, that that satisfies uh, that satisfied a very specific need, a very specific time. Um, anyway, the point is, the um, board games, because board games are over the table and they're not theater of the mind principally, um, they rely on codification, right? So board, board games codify interactions better than any other medium because, uh, like, I mean, of course, I mean, obviously, video games are codified too, but in board games, you actually get to. Um, you get to, uh, I, I wanted to use the word, uh, I don't want to use the term whitewash because it's the wrong term, but you get to, uh, you get to um, sort of smooth over really complicated interactions just using social media. 
things, right? So, well, so for example, uh, I want to use Magic the Gathering because it's one of my favorite examples, right? Magic the Gathering is a very, very staccato experience, right? Like, it, like you know this because anybody who's played Magic and tried to play the digital version of it, right? It's extremely staccato, right? Because you're like, oh my god, that's right, there actually are all these checks. There right. are these checks and gates in every single turn. That is the, the construction of the game. But because it's designed for a social play, you just, you bypass all that, right? Mm. Like, like, draw, land, go. Right? And you've just internalized, like, yeah, obviously, I'm going. I'm not going to verbalize every single gate and every single piece of it. Um, so Richard Garfield, of course, a mathematician, he's brilliant. Um, he just sort of intuitively realized that. He had a bit of an RPG past, too, and that, 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 that's what brought him out of that. So um, since board games are so very codified, you, uh, RPG players can probably, um, I would say, play some board games just for the per like, don't do it to take pieces out of and, and learn from the recipe. Immerse yourself in the idea of just looking at naked interactions and look at the game theory behind interactions. You don't have to worry about the terms, you don't have to worry about, like, but just develop an ear for it, right? Play some bluffing games and like, some pure bluffing games and uh, get a sense for what the dynamics are, with what makes cockroach poker such like what makes it such an engaging experience when it's a game about bugs right why are we like but you're role playing you realize very quickly you're role playing right like you are you are developing a believable you, a you're constructing a narrative you're constructing a uh, you're constructing a subtextual narrative uh and with the intent to deceive um but the intent to be believable um, there's a point where I used, there's a, I wrote a dissertation a while ago saying that poker was the greatest role playing game ever designed. Um, unpack and, that. Uh, I mean, not, don't unpack not, the dissertation. Not, but... not in 20 minutes, I think. <laughs> but, um, but, but look, look here's, here's the download. And this is old. I've actually evolved my thinking about it a little bit. But, but it's, um, right, so when you're playing poker, poker is a game that is ostensibly played at the table, right? It's ostensibly played at a series of hands or a tournament or a game night or whatever, right? It isn't. Right, poker itself. Like when you get deep into poker, um, your your leaderboard is your career. Right, it's your career and the character that you build. Every successful poker player is a character. Has a persona. Right? Yeah. It's a persona, hundred percent. Yeah. They build it and, and it's um, they and they build it for for I mean yes to advancing the game, but not only. Right, like a big part of their enjoyment comes from like becoming. Fusing themselves with their own person, becoming this believable thing. And, and, and when you see like Chris Moneymaker, uh, 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 sorry, Phil Hellmuth in, uh, interact with like Daniel Negreanu, if you don't know any of these things, don't worry about it. But they have, they both have very, they both play very, very clear characters. Yeah. They interact differently with each other, both in and, uh, in and away from the poker table as out. And then you get to watch their, their personas like um, transform into gameplay. Right? Because poker is such a it's such a wide open game with very, very minimal rules, everything else is filling in. Right? Which again that's kind of a wrestling thing too, where it's, your character is your persona and you're sort of Absolutely, right? I, well, right. And uh, so so um, so just study dynamics, right? Um, uh, so I want to talk about really quickly mechanics dynamics, just for those of us uh, I'm sure all of you are way more educated than I was when I started, but Right, like mechanics, of course, are the building blocks for how games work. Right, like, uh, like how D &D when you draw this card, it does this. When you draw this card, it's a set of rules or, uh, that, that, in conjunction, uh, create an experience. Right? Dynamics are behaviors that naturally emerge from the interplay of mechanics. Right, bluffing is not a mechanic; it's a dynamic. Right, um, playing poker, like um, poker, the mechanics of poker are. Right, I'll call it a seven card style. It's called seven card style. I'm going to draw some cards from my I'm going to make a bet and I'm, uh, the, the objective truth of the game. I'm going to make a bet, I'm going to raise, fold, whatever. And at the end of the round, whoever um, the player with the highest bet wins. You may fold if you want, if you think you'll be. The dynamics that are important in that are bluffing, right? Are bluffing, reading, uh, double bluffing, uh, right? And so that. It, Looking at how mechanics, how um, what the in, uh, what mechanics interplay to be, create specific dynamics is very acute in board games. And then there's also there's a pattern thing to that too, where Absolutely. you know you want to 
if you're playing poker, you want to change how you do things so that people, or you want to, or Absolutely. you want to establish like here's what I always do, so that the one time you don't do that, right, it's right. a whole thing. Right, right, right. And that's a little galaxy brain for poker, right? right? Yeah. Like, but, but but like but just, but start there, right? So immerse yourself. So let's go back to like Dominion, right? Uh, uh, for those, Dominion is a deck building game, which by the way. Please, please study it. Like right? that game is, that game is essentially because it's so abstract. It has an ostensible thing, but it's so abstract. You really get to look at it as a tech demo for what deck building is supposed to be. But when you um, play with different different cards and different groupings of cards to see what dynamics emerge from that, right? Look, like a game that's heavy on a tech card it actually creates a, not only. Like a dynamic of how players are going to play, but it actually creates a mood at the table. Yeah. Right? It informs what, uh, like, some people love parts of Dominion, don't love other parts of Dominion because it has all these disparate pieces that you only play with some at a time. Role playing games are grandfathered in that, right? But like, they, they are, they are, well, I'm not telling you already, but you are. Right. Well, but it's like I always, you know, I always say part of the RPG is making sure you want to tell the same story I want to tell. We want to play the same game. Right. Because if you want you to know, <laughs> yeah, well, that's why you, you know, like we call it session zero. Right. Where it's like, okay, you want to hack and slash. I want to tell a grand, dip, you know, diplomatic story. Where can we find some middle ground here that's to right. make us both happy? And, you know, that's part of... I think one thing board games do really well is, you know, I, you used a term I really liked, which is they kind of normalize some interactions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can be a super conflict-oriented board gamer and nobody's going to, you know, and you're probably not going to get punched. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, that's something that board games do. They allow you that frame mm -hmm. to do this thing because it's within the context of the rules. Right. And, and, and do things that maybe you wouldn't normally do. And RPGs, I think, are really... Uh, all over that as well. Right. Well, I, I learned the term magic circle from board games, believe it or not, not, R, not RPGs. Huh. Well, because the language, like when I played, like we didn't have very good language like, uh, for RPGs. Like, we got, uh, when I listen to people play RPGs nowadays, I'm like, oh, the, 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 it's, the discourse has become so advanced. Like we didn't have any of those tools, right? Um, but right, like we didn't even talk about session zero, right? right. We didn't codify it that way. We just sort of did it organically and muddled our way through it. But yeah, exactly right, right? Um, lifestyle board games like Dominion, like Magic, um, those ones are, are ones that you can experience piecemeal. But then also just try a little board game just to experience how mechanics and dynamics interact. Every role playing game, I, like, I, I know I'm probably speaking old school here, right? Because I don't know all the new terms and stuff. But, um, but role playing games, no matter how no matter how storytelling they are, no matter how golden rule they are, do you still have golden rules in there? Oh yeah. Okay. No matter how much they follow the golden rule, they are still mechanical constructs, right? You cannot play a no rules role playing game. Well, I guess you could, but why, right? Like the whole point of the book game. There's some conflict resolution at right. some level. Right, and it's right, and it's norms, right? It's like how, of what set of rules are we going to use to agree upon what kind of experience we want, right? That's mechanics. Yeah. Right? Um, so board games get you really, really good and really sharp and laser focused on how to use mechanics to get the dynamics that you want. And the best, the best learnings that you can get are lateral, right? Mm. Like, like I don't make, I, you notice I don't design a lot of games, uh, board games that are trying to be role playing games. But the way that I, uh, the way that I design role playing games absolutely informs what I do uh, uh, laterally. I mean, I, I was thinking about, uh, uh, while, while you were saying that, like, what sprang to mind for me was Blood Rage. Right. Where, so Blood Rage is a board game where we're all Vikings trying to, like, get to Valhalla, and there's a whole, you know, we're all killing each other and ruining the land, but... It's a family game. It's a, yeah, enjoy it, kids. But the role-playing part of it is the, so you're, you're drafting cards, and these cards say, you know, if you, if you... Kill your if your own people die, you get points. Or if you kill other people, or you know, if you do various things, and that's role playing. Because what you're doing is you are using the mechanics of the cards to make me say, well, I want to fight a lot of fights that I can't win. Right. Which is you know making a choice in the game that I might not normally make. You know, right. that, and it because to use a loaded phrase in uh, the RPG world, it's what my character would do. 
Uh, That's a loaded phrase. That, yeah. Well, so. Oh, I. Oh, I see why. Yeah. 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 I yeah, see. yeah to it's, break the magic circle. Right? Yeah. It's yeah, become yeah. a. It's become a code word for the 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 jerk who's like yeah. you know. Well, it's what my character would do. Yeah. 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 Um, but but in, in in Blood Rage, for instance, it's you know you've you've in a in a weird diffuse way you've created a character based on the cards you've drafted that is right. in you, that is influencing the choices you make. Right. Well, even and even more so, like going one step back, like the um, so what uh, is what we call thematic board game, right? It, so you've described the mechanical heart of it quite well, um, but the thematic is what ties it together, what gives it its vision and its vibe. So yes, you're like when I tell you, your Vikings at the end of the world, right? Every role playing game is a story. Who are the characters? What are they trying to achieve? What's in their way? How are they going to get? Right? It's a classic story. Um, I think of board games that way. Who are you? You are a clan of Vikings that is trying to achieve as much glory as you can. What's in any way? Other players and their ability to stop you in the world. It's all, usually it's always other players, right. but, but how is important, right? As a GM, that's true in my role-playing games as well. Right, so. right. Like, and, but I mean, the how is what's important. Like, 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 uh, um, uh, what is the less what is the less sexist way to uh, to use Shakespeare's seven types of story? Like not man versus man, but person versus person. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. Person versus person. Personal story. conflict. Personal conflict are the best stories, right? Um, uh, so so, but when I, the re I use the the I give a one minute spiel about what the thematics are of Blood Rage, what the the bounding box. It's not just by consuming it, it's, it's, it's the end of the world. The world is in Ragnarok. It is exploding pieces at a time. You are trying to get as much glory as you can before everybody dies. That sets the tone. It gets you, it immediately puts you in the sense of, all right, I know I'm going to die a lot. That's cool. Yeah. I get it, right? That it, that gives you a lot of, that gives, um, it buys me a lot of, uh, it gets me, sorry, it, for, from me, it gets a lot of buy-in for the gestalt of the game, right? Which is an, like, which is a game where like, I want to make a risk type game where like I don't want people to, to, to sit around and do nothing. I want them to get in there, be, feel like a Viking. What matters is not always how much you people kill, but how great you look doing it, right? Yeah, that's a That's cool. an old RPG trick. That is, yeah, that is, that's an interesting idea. So have you found that um, have you found that your designing and your sort of design brain has impacted the way that you run RPGs? Uh, oh, I don't run RPGs well, yeah. anymore, sadly. Uh, the... I have not. Oh, sorry. I don't think, I, I don't think I've don't think i run anything for about uh, about 10 years. Um, uh, I just, because, so, I do, this, I do this for, well, it's, I do this for a living now. Oh, yeah. And there's a, um, there is, RPGs are the most demanding type of game out there, which is why they're so, like, why they're so, like, dear to me, right, and true to you. Um, the I can't put en I can't put enough of myself on the page to put together an adventure. Uh, doing commercial design has ruined me now. When I put this together, I'm like, oh, I just bled on this forever, and I'm going to play this once, and it's gone. I could have made a board game. I'm going to play with hundreds of thousands of players. Um, uh, that, that's, uh, that's me. That's, Although, that's well, but, me. but I think that's actually you know to to. To turn that around, mm -hmm. that's part of what makes RPGs special. Yeah, oh, 100%. Yeah, is 100%. that said, this moment will never happen, you know, like, right. this moment will never happen the same way again. They're special because they demand so yeah. much from the audience, yeah. 100%. Yeah, and, and, you know, that can, but to your point, that can be a good and a bad thing because, right. you know, we've all spent way too much time, you know, figuring out exactly where on this little map this should be, and then, you know, they go off to the right, and instead they're like, hey, what's this cat doing? You know, oh right! I I would love to look like like I even don't want to. Uh, I would put a value judgment on to say that's largely good. I love that. It's that it's, that's on me. That's just, that part of me is broken. I, right. I can't do that anymore without without the without like uh, um, the freelance game designers' guilt going off. Right? Like what are you doing? Like, what, why are you using those? Why are you using all these action points on this when you could be uh, doing greater things? Greater things. So how do you? What do you think? Like, recommend, and, and they don't have to be your games, mm -hmm. but what are a couple of board games that you think would really uh, help a GM to, to do a dive into? Uh, sure, yeah, yeah, I won't recommend any of my stuff. So, um, I will. 
Uh, you can do that when I'm not here. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you all the, the, the um, uh, I'm just edging in my head, the, um, the gateway journey to board games, but I'm going to ask you to do this with a caveat. Don't do it, we said this before, don't do it with the goal of dissecting them and finding stuff to put in role playing in. Just play them for what they are, put them away for a little while, and then and then come back, go back to your role playing game, and then see see how that affects your thinking. Right. So I'm gonna start with Carcassonne. Um, Carcassonne is a fantastically open ended, open world game with very very straight linear uh, 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 strong guardrails, rules guardrails, but it 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 has a promise beyond what's in the box. Um, uh, just play it. I don't even want to tell you what lessons to take out of it. Just play it. Play and, that first. I mean, and that's also a, like that's that you could build your RPG map in Carcassonne. You, you could, could, you could. Um, um, I'm, then I'm going to recommend after that, um, I'm going to play uh, King of Tokyo by Richard Garfield. Um, uh, Yahtzee meets Kaiju attacking New York City. I mean, no, <laughs> attacking Tokyo. Uh, New York is the second. Don't get King of New York. Yeah, uh, sorry, Tokyo is better. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of games that normalize conflict and normalize, like, I'm going to do awful things and it's going to be, we're going to laugh about it. Absolutely. You know, like, yeah. Absolutely. Well, I mean, yeah. And, and be the panda. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, be Cthulhu. Next one is uh, I'm the Boss by Sid Saxon. Um, uh, the negotiation game that is, that the rules fit on one page and the dynamics that emerge from that are off. You'll never play a board game that requires so much creativity to game. Um, it's, it's a mind-blowing experience, and I'd love to see, I'd just look at how, what a skeletal framework can provide so much interaction. Uh, that's a good one. I consider I'm the boss of role-playing game, honestly. It, well, Most I, of, negotiations course, of course games. he would, right? Yeah, 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 of course he would. But good, but, but, it's, but it, it's very clearly a board game. People who come into playing board games who don't have an RPG experience will just play that. Yeah. And, and, but they'll come, they will, you'll absolutely go back to their RPGs with a sense of, uh, uh, Something I won't tell you. No spoilers. <laughs> um, then after that, I'm going to recommend. Uh, you'll notice I'm not going to recommend any of the role playing games in the box. Play them if you will. Um, I don't recommend them uh, if, for the lesson you're talking about. Um, then I would push you into. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do a little bit of shameless plug here. I'm going to actually get. I'm going to. I want you to play Exploding Kittens. Um, I will highly recommend that. So yeah. Uh, uh, Alert! So I do, uh, I do contract work for Exploding Kittens. I'm very deep with them. I can help publish games with them. I work on all the games. I did not design Exploding Kittens. Um, play Exploding Kittens um, with a group that loves it. Uh, the, the hook, the hook for Exploding Kittens is Rush, Russian Roulette as a card game with ridiculous oatmeal art by Matt Lindman of, of the Oatmeal Comics. Just play the game. Um, read the rule book. Make assumptions on what you think that game's going to be, and play the game a bunch. Uh, and then, um, that, I use that game to open people's minds, especially after they get into these, like, into these what we call gamer games or designer games. They use these elegant constructs. I want them to play Exploding Kittens and go, oh my god, this is just fun. It's just fun. <laughs> and hopefully it will tickle your brain to get to make you want to dive into why it's fun. I can, I can write it. I, well, I have wrote uh, I have written a dissertation on why it's fun. I'm not going to share with you the spoiler. Just play it. Um, start there. Start there. That, that should be enough. But I mean, don't just like open up one of the rules and play it once. Immerse yourself in them. Play them five or six times. The character of each one of those games and your experience will change. Not only with, with your experience, but also the character will change with the different groups of players that you play with. And the cool thing about board games um, being such a uh, bite-sized experience, they give you permission to switch groups a lot, right? Yeah. So you get to explore all these different dynamics and, and, um, uh, and so you, you'll get a broader view of, of how that works. Because I know RPGs have been so demanding, you end up being invested. Yeah, I love the, uh, the Exploding Kittens recommendation. Uh, to me, it's what I wanted Bang to be. Interesting. You know, interesting. So, so Bang is a Bang is a is a role playing game. It is a old west shootout, and it's it's hidden roles. So, like, you might be the renegade, and the renegade wants everybody to die. I'm the sheriff. I want to find the outlaws, and and 
everybody knows who the sheriff is, but you don't know who the outlaws or the renegade are. And and then you just shoot each other for. Uh, but but the the challenge. I almost said problem, but I prefer to say challenge. The challenge with a game like Bang is that it's a it, it's a forty five minute game, right. and you could die in the second round. Correct. And then you're just sitting there and exploding Good kittens. Sorry, go ahead. Just funnels that in because exploding kittens is like a fifteen minute game. That's right. Uh, it, now it doesn't have the hidden rules and yeah, that's right. Yeah. right? But but actually, Bang's a great recommendation. I actually would recommend Bang the Dice Game. Yeah, so, Bang the Dice Game is a good yeah. It, 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 it distills that down into into a game, but but it has a lot of overlap with King of Tokyo. So choose branching paths. Ready? You can choose King of Tokyo <laughs> or Bang the Dice Game. You don't need both. And now see what you've done. Well, check this out. We're we're collaborating here. Um, you're totally right. Why on earth did I not uh, recommend a social deduction game here? Um, for a true social deduction game, because there's a lot of role playing involved. Um, uh, I'm not going to do. I, I worked on Battlestar Galactica, but it's a long game and it's very RPG adjacent. I, I want to push you out of your comfort zone a little bit. I would ask you to play. I'd actually, I'd actually to ask you to play the game uh, Hail Hydra uh, by Spin Master. Uh, I haven't played that. Uh, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's fantastic. It, 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 it uses all. It, it captures all those all the intuitions you have about Marvel. If you don't know the Hail Hydra storyline, if you watch. Uh, if you either read the comic or you watched uh, um, uh, 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 Captain America and the Witcher Soldier, yeah. Right. Um, no, no, yeah, yeah. Witcher, yeah if you Soldier. watch Witcher Soldier, but that, that, that that's the condensed version of that story. Um, so play that. Uh, it's a what we call a social deduction game in the role So it's about hidden roles, like as we was talking about, and you're trying to suss out who are the Hydra agents among everybody else trying to play this cooperative game. There is role playing. Players who are native to role playing games will fit so naturally mm. into that world, and they'll play that game forever. Yeah, it's it's really funny because I've I've played social deduction game. You know, I played them here. Mm -hmm. I played them with my gaming group, and it's a totally different experience. Of course, because of course. you know, it's one thing at a. a this is a sweeping generalization, and I want to admit that. But hey, you know, you're you're playing with a board gamer, and they get a card. You're a Hydra agent. You right. know, they're going to be like, well, that means that I have to pretend and do this stuff. Right. You, if you're an RPGer and you get the Hydra agent, they're like, I'm a totally normal person, and this everything. You know, and they just immediately right. start like playing that role. Right. And or they'll it, ask, like, what's my motivation? What are my other quirks? Yeah. Right. What like how do I round out this I mean, character? I was just thinking, you know, saying that makes me think of Spyfall. Spyfall, Spyfall has a, like, when you use the, who, you know, when you use the role thing, and, and you're like, okay, so Spyfall is a, a deduction game where we're at a spot, we're in a hotel, and everybody knows we're in a hotel except one player. And that player, um, we use the app, because the app has made it so much easier. But, yeah, I could imagine. Um, but the app tells you, you're the, you're the spy, you don't know where you are, and then the game is just asking questions. And everybody asks a question to try to figure out where you are, but then there's a secondary part of the game where it says, you're in a hotel, and you're the bellhop. You know, right. and that totally changes how you answer the questions. Right. Well, the context there is like what makes that game beautiful is that you have to interrogate each other to find out. You want to find out who the spy is, but you, um, but you, yeah. you want to do it uh, uh, very subtextually, right? And uh, because if the spy can figure out from everybody else's conversation where they, are, they can blurt out the location, then they win. Yeah. Right. So, so it's a lot of games are like that. Yeah. Right? And. But with oh, it's that, a good distillation. Yeah, right? with that, with that addition, like without the roles, it's not a role play. Without the the job or whatever you want to call it, it's not really a role playing game. Because then it's right. just I want to ask a question in the vaguest way possible. Right. But when it's you're the bellhop, when I ask, you know, have you been here long? You're like, God, you know, you have no idea. You know, it becomes um, yes, yeah. you, you you suddenly become a character. That's right. Um, well, well, look. We could sit here and talk about this forever, but you are super busy and you've been very generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for digging up memory lane. That was a lot <laughs> That's of awesome. I don't, I don't get a lot of role playing talk on. on well, there we go. So, uh, so I have sort of three questions that I always ask to end these okay. things, and you know, I want to acknowledge that you know you haven't played in a while, so that'll change your answers, and that's sure. totally okay. Sure. But what's your favorite system to run? Mine. Yeah. Oh, you're. Oh, that's right. The game of Eric. Right, it, I wrote it for me. I wrote it for me I, to be me for my friends. Air RPG, would we call it? Maybe? Or? Uh, it has a name, but I don't even. Want yeah, to don't, say don't. It. Yeah, all right, no. All right. Um, what is a system you haven't run that you would love to run? Um, I mean, frankly, 
God, frankly, none. Um, uh, uh, because, because the, I, and I hate to say that, but um, uh, uh, I just don't have the energy. I, I don't have the, I don't have the energy. But you know what? No, I'm going to give you. In the best of all possible worlds. I'm going to give you an energy. Uh, uh, an energy. I'm going to give you a, an answer. Um, there was a game, so this will tell you how far behind I am, but to me this is still new in the game. Uh, there was a game I, I, I read about a lot uh, called uh, My Life with Master. Oh yeah. Uh, it sounded great. It's still out there. Yeah, I'm sure it's still out there. I'm sure now it's old school, like, oh, whatever, 50 games have done that better. But, yeah. but I remember that. I remember that game. I think I'd like to try that. I just thought of, like, so your discussion about board games and stuff, I'm still like going, what about, like, and like, like Fog of Love. Yeah, Fog of, so Fog of is interesting. That one, that one is like that one is true hybrid. Yeah, that is blurring like There's actually um, so, a sorry, the second. Reason, the reason I wouldn't recommend that one is because it's very heavy mechanically. Yeah. And what I'm looking for is in this particular thing is games that distill it very, very, very nicely. That is a good point. Yeah, Fog of Love is definitely a it's very French. do this to go here to roll this die to like, you know that sort of thing. Um, there's actually a. You know, kind of like Twilight Struggle 1960, there's a version of Fog of Love that was made that is more RPG. And oh, like, sure. okay. I think it's called uh, BFFs or something. But it's, okay. it's, you know, the same kind of idea, but it's the RPG. Um, and so the last one is the Space Jam question. Eric Lang, aliens are invading the Earth, and they will destroy the place where I keep all of my stuff unless you run an awesome four hour RPG. What are you running? So what are you my running to save the world? To save the world. Or, you know, we had one person answer they wanted to destroy the world. They were they went the uh, Neos route. Woo! Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not into that. <laughs> um, uh, my instinct was to say I would run my own game, but I don't know. I don't think that would save the world, actually, because with the wrong group of players, I think that would be an awful experience. So let's say... But, but um, what an interesting like, time, like frame with these aliens. So right. would be like, oh, that's who you are. Right. right. Well, yeah. I mean, well, you, you, you've. Uh, I mean, to save the world, that means that I have to run something. Sorry, I'm going to go through my thought process Please. here. Please. Right. It means I got to run something that's relatively broad and relatively context independent. Because I'm not going to get to pick my players. I'm guessing, right? It's so, just it's six aliens. So right. Oh, oh, oh it's running for them. Yeah. Oh, 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 oh. So we're in the dark here. <laughs> um, wow. Okay. Presumably belligerent. Interesting. You know what I do? This will probably. This might surprise you a lot. I think I would run Pokemon Junior by Wizards of Coast. Wow! So unpack that a little. So uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Pokemon Junior is the most successful role-playing game that you've never heard of. Yeah. Um, it was designed um, by, uh, and I believe it's Elaine Chase, uh, stop me if I'm wrong, but she's the unsung hero of Wizards of Coast. She needs to be better known. Uh, if I'm wrong, I'm sorry, uh, but I think she did. Um, it was designed, um, it was designed to be a, like a, a product that you play, parents and their kids, um, that is designed by a group of people that have no dogma or baggage of what role playing games are. It's a pure storytelling game. You open the box, there's a booster pack in it, and you get a bunch of Pokemon. And now you're going to tell the story of, your po uh, of these Pokemon, how they came to be, how they found their trainer, the adventures that they have to go to. It is linear with just enough books, just enough, like using the Pokemon metaphors, right? Or the, the metaphor, understanding that everybody sort of understands Pokemon. Everybody, even aliens, you all get it. <laughs> right? um, they, um, you, you are going to make your own adventure, but you are going to follow. Like, I could not fail that game mm. to make a fun experience, no matter who I'm playing with. It's not going to be the best experience they've ever played, but it is going to be. It is going to be the, the, um, the uh, oh, what do I want? It, the, the, it's the Bernie Mac of stand-up of stand comedy, right? <laughs> it's going to make everybody laugh a couple times. It's not going to it's not going to blow anybody's mind. Change your life. But, but, it, but boy, oh boy, is it going to be broad and fun. And I mean, you figure with with the Pokemon and that sort of thing, there'll be some like there'll be some heart in there as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Well, well, be, it's a game. So it is a game designed to play with parents and their kids. So it's designed to be. So the best part of it is designed to be a bonding experience. Yeah. So you're going to you're uh, like, using some modern party game mechanics before their time. Like you are actually going to get to know each other a little bit better, right? Like, and like, how much of this can actually save the, the world? That's how you save the world. That's exactly right. Uh, thank you so much. Oh, this I'm was outstanding. And. Um, folks, if 
Board games are a great way to go through and sort of broaden your idea scape, you know, look at board game themes, look at board game mechanics, as Eric was saying, and non-mechanics also, um, it, and they'll just they'll make you a better GM. Look at how look at how other people tell stories in ways that aren't just RPGs. I think that's a super important point. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for joining oh, us. Sure. This was awesome. Uh, folks, keep the game moving. We'll, uh, we'll be back later with more uh, great GMs. Yes, we will. <laughs>